Greetings. Thank you guys for tuning in for another video. I trust that you're glad to see me, as I'm glad to see you. So I've been meaning to do a, uh, another book review for quite some time, and so hooray, finally I have the opportunity to share with my audience what I believe to be a pretty worthwhile book, a worthwhile read. So without further ado, allow me to introduce On Protracted War by Mao Zedong, otherwise known as Mao Zedong. So I realize right off the bat, I have to make a few disclaimers here. The first being concerned, well, really concerning the author. So I get that most people, or really many Westerners at least, do not have a favorable outlook or opinion of Mao Zedong. And this is quite obviously due to the fact that he was a controversial figure, undoubtedly one of the most prominent and influential in world history, especially the 20th century. For those of you who are not aware, Mao Zedong was the founder of the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party in China as we know it to be today, and his ideas as well as the initiatives that he pushed during his, his rule or legacy in China, by many people's estimations, have been disastrous, <laughs> were and have been disastrous. And so, that being said, I want to urge and encourage everyone who's listening to and watching this, uh, this video to consider Mao as a military strategist because I don't think it's far-fetched to say that this man was a brilliant military theorist and thinker. Um, and so that's really primarily how I'm going to be discussing him for the purposes of this video. Okay. Secondly, I need to note, most people who know me personally already know this, but I have never seen combat. <laughs> I have never served in the military in any capacity whatsoever. And so on that front, I lack a little bit of credibility. I'm simply a guy who admires history, especially the history of warfare and warfare in general, just as a topic, right? So anyways, let's go ahead and get right into it. I need to give some context for this book. So this book is really comprised of a series of speeches that Mao gave about nine months into the Second Sino-Japanese War, which would have been about the year 1938 or so. And you must remember at this time, Japan was on a quest of imperial expansion. And so aligned with their, mis their mission to do that, they were trying to subjugate the peoples of East Asia and the Indo-Pacific. And of course, as a, as a result, their eyes were set keenly on mainland China, which ended up resulting in them invading mainland China. And so, in this book, basically, Mao sort of gives a first-hand account in which he details his ideas and his thoughts regarding that conflict, and he sort of elaborates on what he believes will be the strategies, tactics, and um, ideas necessary to adopt in order to prevail in this, quote, war of resistance against Japan. And so, at this time, I need to... I need to direct more attention to the title because it's super important to this book. And anybody who's ever read The Art of War by Sun Tzu may immediately find the phrase protracted war to be very familiar. And that is because Sun Tzu said something along the lines in The Art of War. He said something along the lines of no country ever benefited from protracted war. And basically what he meant by, by that was that on both sides of a conflict... Both armed forces incur a lot of loss, a lot of damage, a lot of discretion, destruction. And basically, the longer a conflict is drawn out, the worse it's going to make everybody's situation off. The worse off it's going to be for all parties involved. And so, this book kind of alluding to that is interesting, but also, and I'll get to that later, but also what's notable is that in this book, uh, Mao actually directly quotes Sun Tzu at one part, and I'll read it. He says, know the enemy and know yourself and you can fight a hundred battles with no danger of defeat. Sounds a bit cliche, but Mao demonstrated this phenomenally well. He, in this book, he gives the impression that he has a very balanced overview and a solid grasp of China's position relative to Japan's. Numerous times throughout the text, he says things along the lines of, uh, Japan is stronger than China, more superior to China, economically, militarily, politically, even culturally, which I'm not really sure what it means to be superior to someone culturally, but these are Mao's words, not mine, right? So in light of this, 
it kind of raises an obvious concern. If Mao understood that he was the underdog in this fight, if China was the underdog in this fight, what exactly compelled him or convinced him that China stood a chance in actually coming out of this conflict victorious against Japan? And well, that kind of that kind of falls back onto a common mistake that we make as s- students of history especially when we study warfare, we often look at a country's strength on paper. And we say to ourselves, because this country has the most bombs and the most tanks and the most infantry, or they're more technologically advanced or whatever, for whatever reason, we say that these con- this country has all of these very apparent advantages. And therefore, they're going to come out victorious. They're going to be the winners, right? It doesn't always work that way because war is not conducted in a vacuum. War is, war is the one thing, it seems like, the one activity, the one human activity that is so sophisticated, so nuanced, so varied, so complex, that it is almost entirely unpredictable. And I think that any military strategist or any military commander worth his salt is thinking to himself, before, before a battle is engaged and he's thinking, how can I go about this conflict in the most efficient and the most effective way to secure the objective in the quickest way and well that ultimately falls back onto this title which i want to draw attention to once more on protracted war so mao understood something that i suppose the japanese didn't understand as well as he did and this is what it was he understood that japan was running at a very fast pace and he realized that japan could only keep this up for so long. And so basically, the overall premise of this book, everything that Mao discusses, everything that he suggests, it all falls back on this idea of time is of the essence. He realized that with enough time, Japan's strength would do this. It would, ge- it would generally diminish over time. And eventually there would become a point in which Japan was so weak, so, so worn out, so exhausted that China could make the decisive blow in the conflict in their favor and rise victorious. That is in a nutshell what this book is pretty much about. Now, that's a grand oversimplification. And you might notice that it's a very short book. Um, Mao also tends to be very repetitive. So he drills all of these points and ideas into the reader's head. Um, And it's actually something that I appreciate quite well because it stays fresh on my mind. (laughs) Um, But yeah, aside from that, the last thing that I'll mention about this text has to do with philosophy. And this is where it gets really interesting, in my opinion, because Mao in this book makes a very bold claim about war, the nature of war. He says that war is a continuation of politics. And this actually mirrors something that was said by uh, a man by the name of Karl von Clausewitz, who, if you're not familiar, was a uh, Prussian military theorist in this, the, the prior century, who actually witnessed the, um, the French Revolutionary Wars and the rise of Napoleon. And so I, I mention that to say both of these men who lived in different places at different times basically said the same thing, that war is a continuation of politics. Now, that seems very controversial to say because we're often urged and encouraged to think of war as this very violent, barbaric, even primitive activity. And I would I would say, yeah, I agree with that to an extent, but we can't say that that's all war is. Because what it does is it causes us to really undermine the philosophical quality or nature of warfare. And so basically, to sum up what I'm what I'm getting at here is I have in my personal life been super interested in learning about political philosophy and especially the relationship between uh, politics and warfare. And so when Mao said this, this equation sort of entered into my mind. I thought, okay, if war is an extension of politics and politics is in large part derived from philosophy, that is ideas concerning ethics, morality, political and social organization, yada, 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 then war is, in a sense, very philosophical. And that, to me, is mind-blowing to think about because what it says to me is that war is emblematic of the human condition. I mean, if 
you would you would be hard pressed to find any historian who would say anything along the lines of humans do not for the majority or entirety of their history display a keen proclivity for violence for conflict for quarreling amongst themselves it seems like warfare and conflict this this tendency to want to conquer and dominate each other it is almost innate to who we are and i think that that's very key to understanding uh not only warfare and history but ourselves and yeah, that's so that's that's really the highest takeaway from this book, in my opinion, is I ended by thinking of it philosophically. And so I highly encourage you if you're interested in warfare, if you're interested in history, uh, heck, if you're interested in politics, philosophy, this is a this is a definite must read. Um, however, even if you're not interested in any of those things, I think that you'll find this book entertaining and easy to read. And uh, also, I would like to know, do you guys like seeing content like this? Do you want me to do more book reviews? Do you want me to talk about topics that are similar to this? Do you not really care for it? I, I would really like to know your opinion. So please leave your comments down in the comments section below. And also, if you like the video, please like it. If you dislike it, please dislike it. Um, just as always, I appreciate the feedback. So um yeah, hopefully it won't be so long until we uh, we, we converse again. And um, yeah, until next time, I, I hope that you stay well. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.